Hello everyone and welcome to this first episode of the series. This series is an educational one directed to the healthcare providers. We are going to keep you up to date in diabetes care. I'm your host, Hanan al -Tayyib. I'm a family medicine consultant and diabetologist working here in Riyadh, the capital of Saudi Arabia. And this educational series is coming to you by Ethnin. Ethnin is your medical plan backbone. We are going to extend your medical plan beyond the clinic. We will be discussing in this episode three different articles, and they are fascinating ones, starting with the first one, which is coming from the New England Journal of Medicine, titled as Insulin Ephistora versus Insulin Deglodec in patient of type 2 diabetes with no previous insulin treatment. And for those who are not familiar with insulin ephistora, insulin ephistora, it's a once weekly basal insulin. So this is actually a huge deal in the treatment of diabetes and to us, of course, as a diabetologist. And a bit background about insulin, since the discovery of insulin in 1920s until the 1950s, where they found the first uh, uh, basal insulin, there has been a very slowly evolution of the uh, weekly or uh, uh, evolution of the basal insulin until the one we have them today, which are the insulin deglodec and the insulin glargenu 300. So when we talk about once weekly insulin, this is another level of the discussion. Insulin ephistora, it has a half-life of 17 hours. So this is another pretty, pretty steady state of uh, insulin levels in the blood where we're not going to expect those valleys and peaks of the levels in the bloodstream. Going to the methodology of the article. It's a randomized clinical trial where they have included 1,200 patients of diabetes with no previous insulin. And those patients were randomized to use insulin deglodec, and the other arm were randomized to use insulin ephistora. Those patients were adults with type 2 diabetes with average of A1C of 8.2%. And half of those patients were on GLP-1 receptor agonist. So if you think about the, the population of this study, like it's similar to most of our patients that we are seeing nowadays in our clinics of diabetes. And I just want to pause for a moment here and talk a further about the loading dose of insulin ephistora. Now, we are all familiar with the common practice of insulin deglodec, where we are starting 10 units uh, of insulin as, as a start, where in insulin ephistora, we start usually 100 units as a first start. But the authors, interestingly, in this study, they have used a 300 unit as a loading dose. And actually, when the first time I saw that number, I was like, Oh boy, this is a huge, it's a complete different than what we are safely using for our diabetes patients. So there's a thought come in mind, what about the safety? And throughout the study, the safety were actually very well maintained if you compare two arms to each other. In the first uh, uh, arm, which is the insulin deglodec, uh, they had a similar actually numbers to those uh, with hypoglycemia in patients with insulin ephesitora. Actually, in fact, the severe hypoglycemia events were much observed among patients with insulin deglodec in compared to insulin ephesitora. So we are not here actually paying the price of hypoglycemia, but we are having a similar efficacy and safety uh, type or kind of insulin. Now, what were the results? It's a non-inferiority trial, and they were focusing to compare the insulin ephesitora, was it non-inferior uh, to the insulin deglodec or not? And actually it has been proven that insulin ephesitora non-inferior to insulin deglodec when it comes to the A1C reduction. And actually it shows a higher numerical A1C reduction. However, it was not significantly different. Now, what about the most important uh, part of this discussion, the clinical implication. And actually you can think of many, but to me, I think the most important clinical implication that we might think of is the concept of once weekly. Just pause for a moment and think about those patients who are using basal insulin every day. So you are asking them to take one injection every day and that would be seven times a week and that would be a 28 injection per month where we are gonna switch that to only 
four injections uh, per month. It's a great deal, it's a huge change, and I just can't wait to have it here in Saudi Arabia in order to be um, empowered to use such tool. Moving to the second article, which is the setting time and its relation to the physical activity and their relation to the increased cardiovascular mortality among patients of type 2 diabetes. This is a cross-sectional study where it has been looked through the INHANES. And for the, those who are not familiar to the INHANES, it is uh, the national health and nutrition examination surveys across the United States. Well, probably if you think about the concept or the background of the trial, it's not necessarily surprising because there, is a, there has been a large evidence around or discussing the association between probable increase of cardiovascular mortality and the sedentary lifestyle. But the authors in this trial were focusing on is there any relation between cardiovascular mortality and the sedentary life, so basically how many hours do those patients set per day among patients of type 2 diabetes, and was there anything we can do to offset this risk? So they have chosen the physical activity in order to see if there is an offset to that risk or not. And it was resulted that, that there is an increase of cardiovascular risk in association with more timing of sitting. So it's, they said that if there is sitting more than eight hours per day, it, the cardiovascular risk is, is going to be higher. And well, again, if you pause for a moment and think about this sedentary or this sitting time, it's basically, it is everyone here in Saudi Arabia sitting time in an average working day. So th think of me as a physician who is seeing their patients every day in the clinic or any healthcare provider. When a patient comes after the other and we barely move probably for six or eight hours. So this is a huge also uh, effect on our health. And what is that leading us to? Probably we're not going to change those hours. Probably we're not gonna change the practice of sitting and keep sitting when we are seeing our patients. But what we're actually going to do is to encourage ourselves more and more to move to interrupt these sitting hours and engage ourselves of more physical activity. Well, the study showed if those patients or those adults were able to engage themselves more in a moderate to high level of activities from 150 minutes to 200 minutes per week, they were actually able to offset that risk. So this is actually the message that I want to send here is if we are not able to offset or not able to interrupt the uh, timing per day, then probably engage ourselves three or probably four times a week of moderate to uh, high intensity level of activity or probably one to two vigorous activity in order to push the circulation and offset the risk of cardiovascular disease. Then moving forward to the last article in this episode, which is again from the New England Journal of Medicine, the effect of semaglutide on patient with obesity with osteoarthritis. And uh, actually, I love this study because we are nowadays noticing a huge change in the uh, obesity arena management. We are crossing a large milestones than we used to. And us also as a healthcare providers, our understanding for diabetes and obesity, us as a healthcare providers, our understanding of obesity is a complete different than we used to have before. So think again about your obesity patients. Most of the risk hazard that we, that we are discussing with our patient is the excess weight, the risk of cardiovascular diseases, probably the risk of diabetes, hypertension, dyslipidemia. So we are really focusing on the cardiometabolic complications, but sometimes we might forget the biomechanical one, which is really important deal in the lives of those patients. So hence, this trial comes focusing on the osteoarthritis uh, uh, risk for those patients. It's again a randomized clinical trial where they have chosen patient with BMI above than 30 and with a moderate risk of osteoarthritis based on their radiological findings. And those patients were randomized to have insulin, uh, those patients were randomized to have semaglutide versus 
placebo. And those patients were asked basically to stop all the pain-killing medication or anti-pain medications uh, before the study. And the result were they were focusing on the looking into the pain score uh, improvement. In this study, they chose the WOMAC uh, pain score assessment, uh, where 100 is a very painful situation and zero is actually no pain. And those patients were having 71 uh, as a pain uh, assessment score in the beginning of the study. After the randomization and after using semaglutide, the arm of semaglutide showed a reduction to 41.7 of their pain uh, risk score. And the placebo arm, it showed a 25 in their pain assessment score. So basically a 16 point difference if you compare both. And again, it's a huge difference if you compare it or if you think about the pain uh, overall um, in the WOMAC score. And again, this is lead us to the most important part of, the, of, the, of this uh, uh, study discussion. What is the clinical implications? Well, as a physician, and every time when I see my obesity patient comes into the clinic, it's not about the excess of the fat, it's not about the, only the risk of diabetes and the cardiovascular disease, but sometimes we have to think about those patients and how do they live in their daily lives. Osteoarthritis and painful osteoarthritis, unfortunately, could be uh, the, one of the factors that limiting the mobility of our patients, they cannot do their daily tasks, they cannot stand up, they cannot sit down, they can't live uh, a life free of pain. So if we are able to reduce that pain and we are able to push our patient further to be happier in their lives and to improve the biomechanical complications that comes from obesity, then this is an, an absolute winning to us as a physician and of course to our patients. Well, with that, I would like to conclude this uh, episode and I hope that we could be able to cross some T's and dot some I's in the diabetes care. Uh, and until we meet again, stay safe.